we're actually going to be moving on to our last session of the day. You're not going to want to miss this. It's a panel discussion featuring uh, all of our speakers, including Mark Laberton, who will be with us for about half of the panel and then dip out when he needs to leave, Nikki Toyamasito, and then, uh, of course, our last two speakers, Russell Moore and Justin Giveney, and then our, our dear uh, president of the CCCU, Shirley Hoekstra. So if you all can uh, turn on your screens and your mics, that would be great. Um, if you don't know who uh, Shirley Hoekstra is, uh, she's the one that made the cameo appearance during uh, Russell's uh, uh, Russell's talk. <laughs> she popped in. It was, our, it was our little Easter egg. Uh, she became the seventh president of the CCCU, uh, the CCCU in September 2014. And prior to the uh, to the presidency, she served for 15 years as vice president for student life at her alma mater, Calvin University. Uh, she's also spent more than a decade practicing law as a partner and a firm specializing in litigation in, in, in Connecticut. And what many of us might not know is that she works extremely hard behind the scenes to advocate for Christian higher education and leads and serves our institution in ways that many of us do not always get to see. And so I'm really glad that uh, she was able to join uh, this conference and um, uh, in this, in, in especially this panel. If you don't know who I am, my name is Ray Chang, and I serve as a campus minister at Wheaton College and also as the president of the Asian American Christian Collaborative. And um, before we get into the questions, I, I just want to do a little bit of a reflection, especially as we've heard from Justin and Russell and pretty much from every speaker who's named the fact that modern evangelicalism seems to be more of a political, politically driven movement than a theologically motivated one, motivated one, a, a gospel motivated one. One of the key issues that we're facing today is actually found at the intersection between faith and politics. It often seems like we don't know what Christian political engagement ought to look like because we don't have healthy models for political discipleship and political engagement. Simultaneously, we don't see the ways that our politics seems to be shaping our faith more than our faith is shaping our politics. We're divided along political lines and the political lines are tearing apart our friendships and family. As one poll said, over 80% of Americans have cut off a friendship because of the state of politics, while simultaneously destroying Christian witness as we know it. It often seems like we take a posture of avoidance rather than engagement, as too many seem too far gone in their political bunkers. Conspiracy theories are running amok, and as we're seeing with greater clarity than ever before, Christian nationalism, or the belief that the United States has been or is a Christian nation, is far more common than we'd like to admit. Then add to this that politics and race and gender all also seem to be forces that are deeply at play on a consistent basis. I think it's important that people continue to be reminded that Jesus does not fit within any party. It should be disconcerting when Christians spend their energy trying to shove Jesus into an elephant costume or a donkey costume. As, as, as Dr. Moore shared that Jesus is not our mascot. He's not our political mascot. Jesus has been and always will be the Lamb of God, and we have to remember that neither party aligns with Christ, and for anyone to claim otherwise would be misleading. Yet it's pretty clear that many Christians are promoting a conflation between partisan politics and the Christian faith. In fact, just over a month ago, the nation uh, witnessed a mob descend on the U.S. Capitol. It was shocking to see the number, the numerous Christian symbols and practices front and center Unless we think that those who practice uh, participated in this were in some far off community, not within our own. I personally know that we've had parents of, uh, of people within the CCC who attend the rally on January 6th. And we're also seeing more stories come out of pastors who attended the rally and viewed the rally as even worshipful in, ad in addition to breaking and entering into the Capitol building. From what I'm seeing on the ground, about one out of every three students I talk to and I've been interacting with this year have shared that they're either avoiding political discourses with their families altogether because their parents have bought into conspiracy theories or that their families are in significant tension, possibly the most tension they've ever been in because of the political landscape that they're in. And it's actually diminishing their faith and it's withering their souls. A recent LifeWay survey reported that nearly half of Protestant pastors said that they regularly hear people in their congregations promote conspiracy theories. 
My students say that they've heard their family members, their church members, and even some of their pastors promote them too. Many don't know what to do because their churches don't talk about politics, taking an apolitical posture, and many of their churches actually seem to perpetuate the political divides, villainizing those who hold opposing views, or if they take the purple church approach, uh, they talk about unity without actually cultivating it in any meaningful way, often demanding a full assimilation. The word I keep hearing from students within our institutions, and it's just not my institution, uh, about the state of Christian political engagement and the lack of substantive of a substantive discourse and a substantive stance that their pastors and other Christian leaders are taking is to lead them to use the words discouraged and disheartened on a consistent basis as those who are who are entrusted to care for them are not actually doing so when it comes to issues that impact them and one of the things I keep hearing from students is that they're looking for shepherds, pastors, and leaders who will provide them with meaningful guidance and even protection. With that said, I'd love to ask uh, all of you, and maybe we can start with you, Shirley, first. How did we get here? Uh, Ray, thanks for that great introduction. And I'd also like to say thank you to the panelists. I've been enjoying listening and being convicted by what you've been saying. And uh, I apologize for my first ever photo bomb uh, <laughs> for the video. That's that, that's been a first. Uh, but the uh, quality of the conversations actually lead me to some of the remarks I'd like to make for your question, um, Ray. How did we get here? How, how, why are we so polarized? Well, uh, what we've been talking about already is the fact that, uh, and I'm not going to go through the historic events. There's been a lot of well-written uh, books and articles about uh, that one being Jesus and John Wayne, uh, which gives a 75 year history of evangel uh, evangelicalism. I'd recommend that. We've got a micro site at the CCCU website. I think the spiritual answer about how we've gotten here has been addressed by almost all of our speakers in some way in the, and the reason is fear. And here are the assumptions I believe that underlie that fear. The fear is that God isn't enough. He needs our help. There's a fear that God isn't watching or aware, like he's distracted, he's busy, and so he needs us to take the wheel. There's a fear that God doesn't have our future. We believe that, we know, we, we say that in our churches, you know, we know that God holds the future, but we don't believe it. And so we instead insert our own good idea about how America should be and that we will just believe that God will be for it too. They always say that God created sort of a risky proposition when, when he made competent, intelligent, creative humans. And the risk there, of course, is that we would all act like we did not need God, that we could solve our own problems and that we would uh, believe that we had better answers. Uh, Mark Laberton today earlier gave us four traits for leadership and I think that how we got here uh, in this particular moment can um, have a transfer for this. First of all, what do we need to have as traits for believers in order to be an answer to the polarization? And the four uh, traits for believers, um, I first and foremost believe is that we have to steep ourselves in the word of God, fear not, we have to grow in our capacity to listen, fear not those who think di differently. And I think this is, um, as we talked about families, you raised the issue, Ray, about families and tensions. I think that we have to, in our CCCU schools, in our churches, and in our other uh, gatherings, we have to encourage each other not to fear actually those who think differently, even if it is very uncomfortable. We have to nurture our being uncomfortable with otherness. And then we have to have this humility and ask ourselves the question, what does God have in the moment for this gospel witness? You ask in your question, um, how, why are we more political than theological? And all the individuals on our panel have talked about this. I, I remember a story, I was a little girl. I have a grandparent who immigrated from the Netherlands. This is now over a hundred years ago. But decades ago, the evening entertainment for that generation was arguing the fine points of theology. And you were good at what you did, whether you were a 
a factory worker or whether you were schooled, uh, you would take pride at knowing your theology. I think that is no longer a quality that we have either nurtured or exist today. Justin said that politics are faithful and it's because we fear that there is a, a future that God cannot handle. Justin said we're desperate because we don't trust God. There is a lack of trust, which, which means we don't hold on to our theological basis. We, we instead move into the political. And then there is an unexamined racism. You see the gospel condemns racism and self-interest. And to remain in charge, uh, we have to be more interested in our comfort which supersedes the hard work of wanting to understand what other needs. Uh, I think we, we wanna know why uh, evangelicalism uh, remains sort of locked in here. And I just wanna give us to begin this conversation a word of hope. I don't think we will and have to remain there. And, and here's why, just three points. We are a people that are subject to the Holy Spirit's work of conviction and confession. And we are a people who, by God's grace, have the potential to redo our mistakes. And humility and obedience are not foreign concepts for the people of God. Well, I guess I'll try to answer that as well. Um, you know, I think one of the big things is, is and uh, Shirley certainly hit on it, was that people really think the situation is too desperate to be faithful. Mm -hmm. um, you talk to people and you tell them to be civil. They're like, don't you know how bad things are right now? And it's like, that's the whole point. It's not, it's never too far to, to do it the right way. And people just don't see it that way. Um, and, and that's unfortunate. I think when you talk about polarization, you also have to talk about cable news and our dependence on that and our inability to think through those things critically or kind of toss out the things that don't, that don't make sense. Look, we all have these narratives that are in large part fictional. I mean, when you talk about the culture, when you talk about whether you feel like you're a patriot or you feel like you're woke, many of the things that we go back and forth on are half fictional, these narratives that we hold on to. And because we hold on to these fictional narratives, we lose credibility with each other. Because I can see the fiction in your narrative, you can see it in mine, but we, we, never, we never recognize it for ourselves. And when we don't acknowledge that, you do lose the credibility. And so it's hard for us to talk to one another because we don't believe anything the other has to say. I've been amazed at how people can take very serious issues and be so serious about them. And it kind of what Dr. Moore talked about, want to argue and stuff about them, but then also be so performative about them. See, be so hyperbolic. You're, you're this serious about the issue, but you're willing to take it into theatrics. Um, and that's one of the things that's kind of a, amazed me as late, but I think we have to be honest. We have to admit that these narratives that we, that we talk about so much are not completely real and we have to point that out when it's the truth and be okay with that. I always point out that hardly anyone went that went and spoke with Jesus came back with their narrative intact. And unless we're willing to, to be in that same situation, uh, then we're going to continue to lose credibility with one another. We're going to continue to romanticize uh, American history and so on. And it's hard to, uh, to build from such a foundation. Nikki, are you going to, do you have a response, Nikki? Yeah, uh, just a couple of uh, thoughts to stir the pot. Um, I think one of the things that I think helped to contribute to get us here is um, the way that faith is and is not talked about in certain media circles. Um, and I think that uh, on, on the one side, um, you have... Uh, certain media folks for whom expressing any sort of faith engagement is seen as a loss of credibility. And so you don't see the way that some folks who do have a living faith are engaging with some of these issues. And that in other places um, where it is acceptable to talk about faith in the context of public life, um, that it could be a little bit theologically narrow or socially narrow. So I think that's, that's one of the concerns that call it kind of the abdication of the Christian radio space of a, a diversity of voices. Um, the other thing that I think has led to us being where we are has been uh, a little bit of a narrow theological interpretation of scriptures that has not left a lot of categories for systemic engagement. 
it's not to say that it doesn't exist in the scriptures. It's just kind of those who have mediated our access to kind of theological thinking. That's been a, a, a bit absent. And so one of the things that has resulted is that um, I think as Christians are trying to think through engagement with government and that sort of a thing, they have been um, so some of the theological tools or concepts that they have are um, rather anemic. And so I think that has left um, a Christian population a little bit vulnerable for other ideologies to fill in the gaps of what those need because we don't have some of that uh, rigorous uh, theological engagement that knows how to really engage uh, with systems uh, and, that, and that, that sort of thing. So those would be a couple of ideas of, uh, there's so many things about how we got here, but maybe just a couple more to stir the pot. And I would just add a couple of things. One of those would be secularization, but not in the way that most people mean when they say secularization, uh, which is often the idea that we're living in something that's completely new in a disenchanted world. And in one way, sociologically speaking, of course we are, but in another way, we are not. When Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, look to the birds of the air and the lilies of the field, what he's identifying is the fact that there is in our fallen natures a sense of seeing what's right in front of us as being more important uh, than the kingdom of God and those uh, realities that can be seen not by sight, uh, not by sight, but by faith. And it, it's just simply true that often uh, politics and politics is not really even political because it's not about what are we accomplishing and what are we doing? It's not even really about policies. It's about uh, how do we belong to this group of people uh, as opposed to some other group of people? That feels more real to people than the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And so that's, that's part of it. And the second part of it, I would say, is the kind of entrepreneurial market-driven nature of a specifically American Christianity that we have seen for some time. That's been able to do remarkable things because uh, ministries have been able to be built uh, very quickly. Uh, uh, frontiers have been able to be evangelized uh, in all sorts of creative ways. But there's a shadow side to that and a dark side to that. And I think that's, that's what we're seeing, which is uh, a kind of Christianity that, that uh, sanctifies whatever sins the majority of people want to hold on to and demonizes whatever sins the majority uh, in that group do not. Uh, Jesus took that on right away in Luke chapter four when he starts announcing the kingdom and the people in his hometown synagogue uh, are praising him. This sounds so great, just wonderful words coming out of his mouth. And Jesus turns around and says, well, then evidently you didn't uh, understand what I was talking about. And he starts talking about the widow of Zarephath and Naaman the Syrian, that the kingdom of God is outside of the borders that they would want to construct for themselves. And that's when the offense comes. And so when you have a Christianity that, that is reliant upon, uh, let's make sure that we don't have any trouble out of the people that we're counting on to pay for us then you're going to inevitably end up with a Christianity that is some sort of a court religion uh, to, to whatever power the majority of people in that movement um, sees and recognizes. That's, that's part of what has to change. And so when, when people are asking, how do we change this? It's not something that can be changed immediately. You can't do this with a program. You can't do this with this is something that has to happen over a very long period of time as people's consciences are reshaped uh, by the word of God and are reshaped by a vision, not of their next five years and their next 10 years, but their next trillion years. And that, that is going to take a generation to do. I so appreciate what each person has said. It's really been um, very, very rich. I think that a theme that others have touched on that I would want to touch on as well is really the, that sense of uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And, um, and if our first and primary and defining fear is actually what it means to live before God, then it is meant to, to recalibrate all other fears. And 
uh, and when that connection isn't drawn, when somehow a confession doesn't equal a redistribution of and reanalysis of fear, which it often doesn't, then we end up fearing other things much more than we ever fear God. If we actually believe that we were accountable to God uh, and that that God had the power that God has, we would, I think, face circumstances that are so different. This is why Annie Dillard's well-known claim about if we really understood the power of God, we need to have seat belts and pews and hand out crash helmets because uh, it's really the power of God that's actually the primary power, not the power of, of many other systems, structures, individuals, and forces. And likewise, at least in my understanding, the confession that Jesus is Lord is a statement about power, which then means that there is no other Lord and that there is no other power to which we are ultimately accountable and that all other power, like all other fears, have to be resorted in light of the Lordship of Christ. And if it's sorted through the lens of the Lordship of Christ, we end up in a radically different place than in these other kinds of allegiances and alliances and so forth that, that uh, each person has talked about in different ways. Now, of course, I'm not naive about the fact that living under the Lordship of Christ is anything but, uh, but easy or always immediately transparent. I get that it's a long-term struggle. I get that it happens simultaneously, as we have been hearing, with the narratives of others uh, very clearly in place. And I so appreciated the comment about uh, you know, no one's narrative is unchallenged by Jesus. So amen, absolutely to that. Um, but, but I do think that how we got here is in attention to appropriate fear of God and in attention to the Lordship of Jesus. And it feels like it's just a natural consequence of those things. Now, uh, how we nuance that and work out the implications of that, I think is, is a complex task. But I do think that that's the seed out of which so much other uh, distortion and disruption and, um, and, and is both sin and evil systemically and personally flows out of that. And we fear other things. And if you go through an analysis as I've been doing, because I'm in part working on a, on a, an understanding of fear uh, in a manuscript, I'm, I have it uh, in my computer. I hope one day sees the light of day. It's, it's really, it's just over and over and over again, a story of fear, so many fears. And wonderfully, the gospel says, of course you're fearful. I mean, you are dust, hello, you are dust. Of course you should be fearful. Um, there are all kinds of things that can subvert what you hold precious. Um, but the sorting that we most, most need is really the sorting that that a God of grace and love, mercy, protection, healing uh, can produce, not uh, the protectionism of my race or my gender or my um, social location. So um, this is just a, another feature of what we've been talking about, I think. And that's good because all of you are sort of laying the foundations and kind of mining where, uh, where we've come from and how we've gotten to where we are. Uh, kind of shining a light into the socio-historical patterns and forces that have shaped us to this place. Uh, but before we go any further, I think that there's a lot of questions around the the, the nuances and uh, and the practicalities of how we actually live as Christians in a political society. So what should the relationship between uh, the Christian and the state be, between the Christian and the government? And more specifically, how are we to live as disciples of Jesus in these political United States of America? So like, for example, like what should our level of engagement be? How should we engage? What should we expect from the government as Christians? And what shouldn't we expect from the government? Um, in, what, in what manner should we be uh, kind of active with the political processes and, and, and realities? I'd be happy to, oh, Justin, please go. No, you got, you got it, I'll go after you. Okay, <laughs> I'd be happy to share a couple of thoughts. I think that there are a lot of different levels of engagement and I think these expectations that Christians should have about the role of government in our lives, I think there's a lot of uh, rigorous theological diversity of what that might look like lived out. Um, 
I think one of the the guiding principles that we at Christians for Social Action look at is um, that what we are all uh, invited to is to bear witness, uh, to bear witness to the character of God in the public square, uh, that there's this aspect of personal uh, discipleship or public discipleship that's happening in the, in the public square, and that um, our political lives, as with all areas of our life, need to come under the lordship of Jesus. You know, so what does it mean for us to respond uh, to God's invitation and God's greater work, particularly in uh, the places where we have some access and, and power to, or decisions to make, or agency? Um, but on a very personal level, I guess the way I think of it is. I do think um, that neither political party is able to reflect fully uh, the complexity of who God is and his love for a tremendous number of people and uh, the dreams that God dreams for the world. And so um, I do feel like Christians and the church ought to play a prophetic role or conversational role with government um, to neither be too much a part of it, uh, to be beholden to it, and not to be too far away from it as to presume that there is no effect um, on folks. What some folks call political is actually a pastoral issue for our churches. Um, for me personally, the way this works out is uh, my family um, is part of the mass incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. And by most accounts, people did not protest the treatment of Japanese um, as they were gathered up and shipped out under barbed wire and guns. And so when I am out there, whether it's trying to uh, stand up and advocate on behalf of children separated at the border uh, in immigration areas, when I'm marching in Black Lives Matters, all of those things for me are an action of bearing witness to the character of God it happens to be in our political space. It's saying that black lives and black bodies are made in the image of God. That is why I'm standing here with Black Lives Matters. It's saying, you know, children separated from their borders, God is hearing that cry. He's compassionate, able and powerful. I do that because when other people look back on this moment and ask, where was the church? I want them to know the church was there bearing witness. So. Um, that's how that forms a little bit of how I think about how the Christian communities we touch, we want to encourage them to engage. Yeah, I think that was great. Um, I, I would just say, you know, we know Jeremiah told us that we have to care about, you know, we have to love the city we're in and want the best for it. And so we do have to want the best for what's going around. We also have Romans 13, which, which, which keeps us from kind of being in the mindset or the posture of always being an enemy of the state as well, right? Uh, that, that, there, that this is ordained from God and there's an order and a justice that should come from government and that we should expect from government. So I think we do have to take that in, into consideration. And depending on, again, what your ideological orthodoxy is, sometimes Romans 13 is hard to deal with, right? Sometimes what Jeremiah was saying is hard to deal with. But then there's also kind of that tension with, with the prophets though too, right? To, to see in instances when there's that order missing or when that's, there's that justice missing and you have to be aimless instead of I am Isaiah the priest and say, no, I'm not gonna allow this to, to continue. I mean, we see in Isaiah that when, uh, I think it's Isaiah 59, that when God's people were just allowing injustice and unrighteousness, God is just appalled. He's like, wait, what are you doing? You know, my people who are called by my name doing nothing, being comfortable with this injustice and with this iniquity. Uh, and so there is a time when Christians have to stand up and do something about those things. And I, I think so much of the Christian life is about understanding that kind of tension. I think we as, as humans, we try to jump on one side of the tension and try to avoid it. But I think we need to understand and be very thoughtful in how we engage and when it's time to stand up and say something. And when it's time to say, hey, this might be against my preference, but for the sake of justice and order and what I'm called to do, you know, I either need to step back or I need to support kind of uh, what's going on. It's not always easy, but I think in community and if we're being vigilant, we can find the right places to step in and, and do what needs to be done. Uh, and so, so the Christian has to be active. We have to, as, as I said in my talk, we have to be thinking about human dignity and how we protect human dignity because that's not one of those things that we can let slide. We have to be thinking about human flourishing and if we do that only within a partisan, from a partisan lens, I just don't think we understand how much we're missing when we limit our public witness to what partisans are saying, to the talking points that they create in these talking point factories 
with who knows what the motivation is or what the end game is, in many aspects, Christians have to have their own language. And whether it, when, you know, whether it's the conversations about social justice or otherwise, we cannot always depend on the language that's coming out of academia, uh, that's, that's coming out of you know, different activist groups. We have to be brave enough to use our own because in many cases, that language that we're getting is just not nuanced. And it's not meant for any type of reconciliation. It's not meant to lead us into the direction of, of healing and being peacemakers. Amen. To, to, uh, go ahead, Russell. Oh, no, go ahead, Shirley. Well, to uh, what Justin was saying about uh, being prepared for your witness, I think as individuals, we need to have a set of guidance and guide rails, guard rails for when we are engaging with government. And it starts, and I think this is a really simple thing. This is uh, just a, a, like a toolkit that I'd like to share uh, for students who are listening on this webinar or for others uh, who are thinking about their engagement. And it is to write down for you what you want to be known for as a Christian when you're engaging a person or an organization in government. Uh, early on, I just wrote down 10 Bible verses that I would want to actually inform my own posture and be my guidance um, and also give me some guardrails when things came up unexpected. I'll just share four of those 10. Uh, the first one is uh, love God above all and love your neighbor as yourself. And that keeps of course my focus on God first but then my neighbor second. And then the second, which is go therefore and make disciples. And I think even if I don't win a particular political point, if someone said to, after a visit by myself or my organization, boy, those people call themselves Christians. I'm interested in that. I'm interested in how they approach that issue because maybe Christianity has something to say to me. So that great commission. And then the, the third one is um, kindness leads to repentance. And I am always mindful that God's kindness um, has been abundant in my life and has led to my repentance. And I think if my posture is a posture of kindness to those in which I'm engaging, perhaps if their lives are in need of some repentance, this will be a, an opportunity for that to happen. And then the fourth one of the 10, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So sometimes you can see your opponent as an enemy, uh, or you can see that you want to convince somebody to your point of view, and it can have sort of a negative implication in your mind if it's unchecked. And the point is, is that while we were yet uninformed, not where we were supposed to be, Christ died for us. So that's just a posture question. And I, I'd suggest it's, it's been a wonderful exercise to write down those eight, 10, whatever it is, verses that you can keep in your mind when you're engaging with others in government. And I would just add uh, the songwriter, Bob Dylan had a lyric uh, years ago that said, uh, I gave you my heart, but you wanted my soul. And uh, that, that's exactly what often is going to be demanded of someone from political movements, regardless of what they are, which is a, a handing over of one's conscience and, and one's soul into a blind trust. So when Jesus warns his disciples, beware the leaven of Herod and the Pharisees, that, that would have seemed unusual to say because Herod and the Pharisees were completely opposite. And yet he said, there's something about uh, that, that sort of uh, allegiance that can invisibly change a person in negative ways. And so what I would say is for somebody who is called to engage uh, directly uh, in the political system, ask yourself where you're particularly vulnerable. If you are not going to be able to speak in areas that your political movement would tell you not to speak. Uh, you, you're, you're not going to, in terms of human dignity, talk about unborn children because that would render you, uh, uh, it would render your, your possibility of going forward impossible. Or you wouldn't be able to talk about immigrants and refugees and the poor because that would make you uh, una unviable in your political movement. Then you don't really have a political movement uh, you have a, an authoritative Bible uh, that's other than the Bible that you've been uh, given. You have a church, uh, and that's not what a political movement is for. It's about coalitions of people who believe things and who have uh, individuality and consciences, but who are able to work together. 
So watch that and see uh, where you're being pulled into a kind of idolatry. And also uh, watch and recognize, know yourself. So I'm often asked by uh, college students, Christian college students will say, should I go into politics? Um, and what I usually say is kind of counterintuitive to a lot of them because we're told go where your passion is and do what you're passionate about. Uh, in some cases, that's right. But this would be one that I would say is an exception. If you are passionate about politics and you have a need to uh, hold political office, then that's a dangerous place for you. Uh, instead, the people that we need in politics are the people who are perfectly happy uh, serving and who are also perfectly happy losing. And, uh, you know, the, the generals who do the best, uh, the best fighting are those who don't like to fight and who don't find meaning in war, but who understand the cost of it. And the people that we need in the political arena are the people who have a sense of themselves in terms of something bigger than government, bigger than ambition, bigger than acclaim, and are going to be willing then to do what's right. And it just so happens, those are the people in the long run who are the most effective anyway. That's so great. That's so good. Yeah, Mark, please go ahead. I, I was just gonna say that what it provokes in my mind in part is uh, Daniel chapter three, where first, uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar has this idol built, calls everyone to bow down and worship sets in motion the mesmerizing rhythms of conformity so that every time you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble, you shall worship and bow down to the golden statue the King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. That mesmerizing rhythm comes to its focus, uh, not, I think, in the fire particularly. It comes just before that, when uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego demonstrate a committed but unhooked life. This is the it's the great theological drama of that moment. They're clear about who they are and to whom they belong. And then they're unhooked, even from Nebuchadnezzar's rage, let alone his fire. And I think the balance is we want to bring into the public square a depth of commitment, identity, clarity, purpose, conviction. And we want to be unhooked from the surrounding rhetoric, demands, insistence, you must, but you have to, it's only this way, uh, bow down and worship. I was horrified today to see images of a, of a literal golden statue uh, that has been prepared of Trump's head that's going to be at the CPAC meeting. Uh, and <laughs> besides leaving me horrified and speechless, it provoked this text as other texts again, of a, of a literal form of conformism to an idolatry that is literally perverse to the gospel and to the, to the nature of the Christian faith. And uh, so I just think it's a, it's a really, really important thing to be able to live a deeply committed life. God may deliver us, he may not deliver us, uh, but what I'm not is hooked by your rage, your anger, your insistence, your demands, your narrowness, whatever it might be. I could also just add one more thought on the how should we engage or what should our level of engagement be? Um, I think uh, that there is um, a lack of voices represented or involved in our government systems from certain ones of our communities. And I think part of what I would hope is um, we need folks who are willing to wrestle with their faith in some of those contexts and they might have to do it a little bit live. Um, and so that's where I would sort of say, if you're coming from some of the communities that have been disenfranchised or that have been sort of cut out of the political processes, I, I, I think I would just sort of ask the question of where has your community been in relationship to some of these political systems and just take that into account as well as you're trying to figure out when and what needs to be in place uh, in order to sort of discern with Jesus, is this something I should say yes to? So Ray, you also asked us to think about what shouldn't we expect of government? So I think everybody on the panel are engagers of government. We have a belief that government can be effective. We know that it's God ordained. Here's what I would say, expect to be disappointed from government. And first of all, it's made up of human beings. Uh, second of all, there's a lot of crosswinds that everybody has to deal with. 
Um, always approach it as what don't I know about what their crosswinds are today. And remember, we already have a savior. Like sometimes we think that government is going to be the savior, the solution um, piece. And, you know, government is just an instrument set up um, on this earth in order to do well by the human beings that are amidst them. And, you know, we happen to have a system of government that allows redress in the courts, that allows you to be in front of your representatives. I mean, I can only imagine day in and day out when you're in a, in a staff office for a representative or a senator, they just hear, what, uh, 50 requests a day, um, just so many people who are knocking on their door. And that's really fantastic. But they have to sort of sort that all out. So expect to be disappointed. If you expect to be disappointed, you are going to be able to have the persistence to try again. Like it's not a one and done. Um, it is a long, um, persistent, incremental belief that something that you would like to change or you would like to contribute has value and meaning, but that our ultimate faith, hope, trust, all of that is in Jesus Christ. I would like to just add to what uh, Shirley just said, that sense of having a sense of limits of government is critically important because if you don't, what you're going to end up with is either the kind of disappointment that's going to lead to cynicism and total withdrawal. Nothing, nothing's going to work because it didn't work before in the way that I expected. Or you're going to lead, and everybody on this panel working in government has seen this. There are some groups who actually have given up on government and they appear to be engaging government, but really what they're doing is theatrics for a, a fundraising group. And so you can tell that with a kind of, uh, if everything is always on the edge of apocalypse, if you don't act now in terms of giving money to me, or if you don't act now in terms of mobilizing for this election, everything is gone. Then that usually is a very cynical uh, sort, of, uh, sort of engagement that actually is not trying to engage with the governing authorities, but is trying to build uh, a mailing list. And that's a cynical move that, that actually fails. That's excellent. Um, I mean, you're, you're, you're sharing things about how our social location impacts us, how uh, our salvation is in the Lord and not in our governing officials. Um, but we still live in a political and, and a partisan society. What do we do about our partisan identities? Yesterday in one of the sessions, I, I, I shared some research about how um, Stanford and, and Dartmouth professors found that our political identity is a stronger form of identity than is our, uh, our race, our ethnicity, and our faith. And we're seeing that more now than ever. And we know that as Christians, we're called to be Christians first and Christians most, which I sometimes think is lacking as a lot of people seem to give lip service um, uh, to being Christians without actually demonstrating their Christianness in the political sphere, which I really appreciated what you said, Shirley, like, what do we, what's the witness that we're bearing? Nikki, you said the same thing. Um, but what's the relationship between our faith and our kind of partisan identities as a Republican, a Democrat, or something else? Because I will say that I, it's been surprising to hear of many faithful, orthodox, Christian, evangelical, or evangelical adjacent pastors who haven't gotten jobs at churches that say that they uh, that that tout their multi ethnicity and have hundreds of languages because they were seen to vote for Obama because they were black, or to hear that uh, there's a consistent uh, kind of um, pressure that uh, that many people say that if we don't cater to a kind of far right wing or to the right wings of of the government that our institutions, especially Christian institutions and churches will lose their funding or, you know, or that, um, you know, I mean, you just kind of go down the line and you, you hear that, you know, that there's this there's a stronghold that seems to take place and you, you see it through the more the influence of the moral majority uh, where uh, Republicanism and, and, and Christianity and evangelicalism were married to each other in a lot of ways. Uh, but as I'm looking at the landscape, I think that both the far right and the far left are problematic and troublesome. And we're seeing that both polar uh, kind of ends are pulling people from the middle towards them. 
But within the evangelical world, I don't see the far left as a significant force that's dividing us. I think that there's a lot of fear that they might eventually divide us. I, I, what I do see is that the far right is dividing us through the conspiracy theories and through some of the, 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 the kind of Christian conflation with the partisan lines. How do we make sense of that? And how do we navigate partisan identities and partisan commitments? Because we do live in a partisan society. Maybe I'll start with you, Justin, because you're the and campaign guy. Uh, sure. I think the first thing is you have to know your identity before you really get seriously engaged in politics. Now, I want people to get engaged, but you you have to know where you stand and who you are. I, I can't tell you how many people, if you look, just look at the, the trends, change their opinion on immigration because of conservative talk radio or change their opinion on the Christian sexual ethic because of what Obama said, right? Uh, people are tying their identity to their political party in a way that just isn't healthy. And I think one of the things that we can do is see the party as a tool and nothing that should really be part of our identity. So me telling you I'm a Democrat, anybody who knows me knows that only tells you so much about me, doesn't really tell you all that much at all. It's because your party to me should really be almost more of a strategic play than, than anything else, right? It should, you know, it should have to do with where you are, where you can be influential, but it shouldn't really all have that much of an impact on what you actually believe. And I think we do need to question even the idea of partisan loyalty. It doesn't mean that there aren't you know, practical benefits to sticking with the party and actually working with the party. That could be good. And there are several things that you, know, you may uh, really just, uh, your values may be cl more closely tied to one side or the other, but you always have to make sure and be vigilant about that your values aren't changing based on that identity and, and based on uh, that association. I see that so much, especially among people who actually want to enter into that conversation. I mean, it, you know, I, I really have, you know, lamented about the how many friends I have in my space who really were Christians. And then when they want to run for office or they want to run campaigns and get to a certain level, they know they just have to leave some of their convictions behind. And for Christians that just can't be an option. If they can continue to kind of isolate us and, and pick us off because we're, we're not willing to stand up when we need to, then, then of course we're gonna, you know, people are gonna get out there and they're not gonna have the cover they need to be who they need to be, but we have to come together and we have to stand on our principles. And again, see the parties as, as something that's a tool, but the parties in our ideological tribe should never be the masters of our social action. And I think too often that's the case. Anyone else want to chime in? I'd love to continue to hear. I just want to, I want to chime in just very shortly. I think that Christians should have the goal of having individuals or groups or government say you always want a Christian on your team. Like if people aren't saying you always want a Christian on your team, that's why the people who are running for office don't want to say they're Christians. Because actually what that's saying is you don't want a Christian on your team. So like, so if you don't want a Christian on your team, why not? And, and I think those of us who are Christian and, and I, I, get the, I get the temptation to downplay it because you wanna attract the masses and if there's a negative implication for Christians, but those of us who are Christians and if we are the aroma, aroma of Jesus Christ, then we can say it's our responsibility to do better. And anyway, I, I just think that, that uh, a metric of doing better would be people saying you want a Christian on your team. Mm -hmm. And I, I agree completely with the sense of having an identity before uh, being involved in, in these various things. Political parties are good institutions. Uh, it's, it's a good way uh, for people to advance um, a, a push toward uh, the common good and, and toward loving neighbor. Uh, but what I would say is look at your own vulnerabilities. Uh, again, if you can't be the sort of person who can come in and say, I'm willing to work in my party structure, but my party's not going to own me, and I'm okay if my party ever sends me into exile, then you shouldn't be doing it. So it's a, I know a church that does great work uh, with uh, sending in people to do evangelism in uh, bars and nightclubs, uh, but they're not going to send a friend of mine who's a recovering alcoholic. He knows he's not going to go. Somebody needs to be there, but it shouldn't be him. And so you have to know your own uh, vulnerabilities. And if you get to the point where you say, 
I'm okay working within my party, but if my party ever says to me, uh, you have to conform to everything or you're out, I'm okay being out. If that's who you are, then work and God bless you. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think one of the interesting things that's <clears throat> underlying a lot of the crisis that we're facing relates to why it is that Christians in America, especially evangelical or more conservative Christians, find uh, pluralism such a problem. And, and yet, so we're in a moment where there is an insistence, both from, the, from those dramatically left or dramatically right ends of the spectrum, for pushing toward a kind of ideological homogeneity in an, in an era of irrepressible, unstoppable pluralism that is only going to continue to multiply, 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 multiply. And the idea that somehow a Christian view equals uh, an eradication, which it seems to be in both left and right, sometimes the, the way of approaching these things, an eradication of pluralism is, is not gonna enable us to be able to live freely and exercise our identity. It's going to always squelch that in the name of homogeneity. And so much of what I think happens in political parties for an understanding of allegiances and, and uh, quote, shared agendas is an unwillingness to live inside a party with principled pluralism. If that happened inside parties and if parties became places where you could actually really have deep differences and negotiate common space, then th those enterprises would be entirely different. And to some degree, people have said that's what parties at earlier eras have been. I, I think that's probably, it's more true, I think, in the past than it is now. I'm not sure that it was particularly true then, but it is perhaps more true. But now, because there's this push, an, an impossible, a foolish, literally a foolish push toward homogeneity around certain ideological principles, rather than a, a view of principled uh, pluralism, we're, we're really in a, in a matrix that has so many of the of the hot buttons that just continually then will continue to re-explode and do their damage their shrapnel will fall everywhere and um and i think the, for a christian identity there is a deep sense of being able to say i i am who i am i we are as god's people who we believe are called to be and we live in freedom and truthfulness and honesty in a pluralist context and I want to engage and know and be salt and light in that kind of setting. That, that's a vocation that seems lost at a time when so much um, hostility and, and I would say a push for homogeneity of, of thought and action and, and convergence around things around which there will simply not be uh, a, 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 an achievable goal of conformity in that way. Yeah, I think as Mark was talking, it was helping to piece um, together. Um, I, I appreciated, Mark, the distinguishing that you made between identity and ideology, because I think that's a little bit of, to be quite honest, I'm not exactly sure how to engage with the question, because I think I am moving a little bit away from identity and more towards trying to understand the power of ideologies. And I'm, and I'm a little bit trying to understand some of the landscape of that. So some of some of what has been interesting to me is to see, especially in Asian American political engagement, the extreme differences in political conclusions across generations. And, and so I think some of the understanding of ideology is helping me sort through rather than having to footnote and make exceptions for everything. So all that to say is I'm a bit on, a, on this journey of trying to understand the interaction between identities, ideologies, and then, um, and a little bit of yeah so just in case that out loud talking also helps somebody else and that's good i mean because i think especially as asian americans we have strong na nationalistic tendencies uh that are oftentimes more connected to ideological commitments when we see our histories of migration and and uh and and that's a huge fourth and and both the nationalism and the uh, ethnic and racial kind of realities take force in, in our political engagement, um, which actually brings us to a, an important question, which I think is, you know, the, the growing discussion around Christian nationalism and its influence on Christians in the United States. Uh, I don't know if 
people are very clear about what Christian nationalism is and if there's a way that you can help parse it out, like how do you know if you're a Christian nationalist? Um, is it a good thing? It, yeah, isn't being Christian anything a good thing? Um, you know, should Christians be Christian nationalists? I, I feel like I'm asking questions that I know that many people are asking themselves and may not have resources uh, at their disposal or at the rapid disposal. And, and, and I'm just curious if you might have something to share. And then of course we, um, we had Mark uh, drop off because he has to lead a weekly commitment, but we were really grateful that he was here. Uh, but maybe, uh, yeah, Russ, you, you've been writing uh, a lot about this recently. <laughs> if you don't mind chiming in, that would be encouraging. Well, I think that uh, the, the term can be confusing for some people because uh, they assume that what nationalism means is patriotism, uh, loving one's country. And, and, and that's not uh, what's meant by that. Patriotism, when rightly defined, is a good thing because patriotism is a kind of gratitude. Uh, someone is, is honoring uh, one's country the way that one honors one's father and mother, uh, recognizing the, the blessings that have come to a person because of uh, the good things about one's, one's country. But that's not what we mean by this sort of uh, nationalism that says instead that Christianity is a means to an end uh, toward the country and uh, the country and the identity that comes with the country is always right. Um, and that's not a, a Christian vision of reality at all. Our first identity is in Christ, which means that we are connected to the body of Christ all over the world and uh, present in front of uh, Jesus in heaven right now. That's our, that's our first commitment. And every other commitment is second to that. And so the kingdom of God is, is first. But what is happening right now, it's not just in the United States, it's happening all over the world is that there are those who want to uh, form identity around blood and soil. And Christianity is often a useful way to do that. And it's not just Christianity, there are other religions that are used in similar ways because a religion by the nature of being transcendent uh, means that it can claim your ultimate allegiance. So if someone can say, uh, in the interest of German nationalism or in the interest of America first nationalism or in the interest of Malaysian nationalism or, or whatever, I can, I can get you to claim that as a religious identity, uh, then that means that it's unquestioned and unquestionable. And uh, that's what's so, so deadly and dangerous. And that's one of the reasons why you can see people who shift their viewpoints of what's right and wrong, uh, not because they've been persuaded uh, by conscience or biblically, but because of where their movements are, are going. After the January 6th uh, insurrection, I was on a Christian radio uh, network where someone said, well, how can one know if one's at something like that and it's, it's something that's not appropriate? And I said, if, if you're in any gathering where people are building a gallows, then uh, you're at something wrong. I mean, that, 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 that's, that's really not a difficult sort of ethical formulation to take, but it is if the way that right and wrong and truth and falsehood are being defined is in terms of the, uh, Nikki used uh, the term ideology a few minutes ago, and that's exactly right. What ideology is, ideology is not a set of ideas. Ideology says, in order to belong with us, you have to sign up to this entire package and never deviate from it in any way as a sign of loyalty to us, whoever that is. Uh, that's not uh, the way that a Christian can live. Uh, we, we have to be the people who are walking according to, to truth and according to what's been revealed in scripture and conscience and where that conflicts with some other claim of uh, allegiance. Jesus has to, has to be first. I'd like to ask um, Ross a question. Do you think, uh, Dr. Moore, that there has been a desensitization towards outrageous things, right? So it seems yes. so cl clear, like if there's a gallows there, you bad. But what is it? So what has happened so that we see a lot of outrageous things now and there's this desensitization we, we've lost, we're, we're becoming confused and lost. 
You know, I think it has something to do with a, a friend of mine was talking to me, talking to a group of us a couple weeks ago about what it was like for him as an unbeliever to start going to church because he was interested uh, in a romantic possibility with a young woman there. He started going to church and he said what happened is he was sitting there singing all of these hymns and participating in all of these prayers, not caring anything about it. But over time, just the very act of singing these things and, and praying these things started to change him. And, and he started, well, God's designed uh, the world to be that way. And I think with every good thing, there's a, a parasitic uh, shadow side, a dark side to that. And I think that's what we're seeing now is that often you have people who are theatrically engaging in whatever it is that their, their crowd demands. And then uh, they become, you know, Paul says, don't be conformed to this world. There's a way that the mind becomes conformed to that and a way that one starts to accept little by little by little more and more of these demands until one is not even recognizable as the, as the same person. And so if you think of what C.S. Lewis warned about with the inner ring, and uh, really what he's talking about is what Jesus was talking about in John 12. They loved the glory that came from people more than the glory that came from God, that sense of wanting to, wanting to belong and there's a way that one can talk oneself into almost anything as the sign of, of entrance. That can happen in a workplace break room. That can happen on a factory floor. That can happen in a state legislature. And it can happen in the entire uh, political movement. Yeah, that's great. I, mean, I think that was a very clear um, kind of diagnosis. And I think if people can... Uh, even self-reflect, you know, because I think one of the conversations I hear over and over is that most people who have bought into this ideology or to this kind of perspective don't even know it, and they're and and they and they're having a hard time seeing it. And so maybe we can start with self-reflection. But you know, not not only is Christian nationalism an issue, but we're seeing that the historic kind of tensions uh, that emerge through race and politics um, are also significant. I mean. This includes votes among white, black, Asian, and Latino Christians. We, we saw a stark contrast, and we've historically seen a stark contrast between white evangelicals and black Protestants. What do we make of this? How are we supposed to understand this? What, how do we navigate kind of this reality that we are, that, that people who are Christians uh, what, vote in different way because of their racialized experiences? and because of the way that society and, 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 and social forces have impacted them. What are we supposed to do with that? Well, I think we have to realize that not all of that is bad, right? I mean, the, the Bible gives us a framework. It doesn't necessarily speak to every single issue. And so sometimes it's okay for our experience and you know things around us to speak into how we vote and for us to disagree on what the best thing is. In, in certain instances, you have situations where we do maybe want the same end and we think, you know, there's different ways to go about it and, you know, um, and, and that's okay. So I don't think we, we have to be very careful when we say that, you know, people have to like this certain policy on, on every issue as if the Bible speaks directly to it. I think we need to worry about that. The problem comes when we're not focused, you know, when there's a, a very clear justice issue or a very clear kind of moral or, order issue. And again, our uh, our partisanship or our ideological tribes get in the way of what is fairly clearly, you know, a Christian conversation, right? When we're lacking in compassion uh, because we've gone too far to the right on, on an issue or we're lacking in conviction because we've gone too far left. Just like I said, for a Christian to, to simply call uh, something like abortion, um, you know, a, a justice issue. I think it is missing something there. I think there, there, there's room even within that policy for some disagreement, but when it comes to the dignity of human life, when it comes to, to pr protecting that dignity for, uh, for minorities and, and for others, we need to be pretty close. And so I think what we have to do is identify those areas where we have common ground, where we have imperatives like the justice imperative and saying, hey, we can disagree on a lot of things. We need to have a level of agreement on criminal justice and proportionality. We need to have a level of agreement on uh, when it comes to the sanctity of life. Those are the issues, but we need to make that separation because often we see, you know, somebody gets really deep into social justice and everybody that doesn't agree with the, that 
exact policy that they want is now a racist and now needs to be canceled and all this. Sometimes that's the case, right? Some, sometimes it is a lack of compassion, but other times it may just be a difference of opinion and we need to engage in a conversation to see how close we can come. And that all takes time, it takes relationships and we have, have to be willing to, uh, to invest in that, uh, to, 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 to come to the right uh, positions. I would say one of the things that I have found helpful, particularly in those areas where there are big areas of divergence is to welcome in the voice of the global church. Um, I have found that, especially on some of our politics, some things are just crystal clear that to me are awfully confusing. Um, and so I have found um, that that has been really helpful to be in some level of dialogue. The, there's just different questions that get asked. And I think all of this is really, you know, in, in pursuit of trying to be faithful, um, faithful in our relationship to Jesus and, and, and what God's kingdom looks like on this earth, you know, so uh, there's a, some similar uh, intention, but also I think realizing that there is a reasonable disagreement on the conclusions that folks might take. Um, but I just want to toss that out there, even as we're looking at um, differences across racial, I think social, economic, rural, um, urban, and then for me, the, the global church voice is actually particularly helpful as well. And I think that when it comes to uh, some of these questions, we, we actually know how to do this better than we think we do, because we do it all the time with personal morality. Uh, there are some aspects of personal morality that the Bible is so definitive about that, uh, that, that we're able to say very clearly, thus saith the Lord. So no one has to say, you know, in our congregation, we have some people who think embezzling from their workplaces is fine and some people who don't. We send them say, you shall not steal. Uh, we have other issues in personal morality where there are certain principles, but we don't uh, necessarily apply those in the same way to everyone. So we, we talk about honesty, we talk about integrity. We don't talk about here's the blueprint for how to live as an archeologist or, or, or how to live as a, as a songwriter. And then there are going to be other things where we say, uh, Romans 14, we, we have differences of opinion on whether to eat uh, meat or, or vegetables only, and we're able to live with one another despite those, uh, despite those differences of conscience and not to bind one another's conscience. Well, we ought to do the same thing when it comes to our lives in terms of, of how we live together. So there are going to be some demands of justice very clearly revealed in scripture, uh, where we say, thus saith the Lord. And there are going to be other uh, claims of justice where we're going to say, we have certain principles, but we're going to have our consciences shaped and formed in different ways, as Justin said, to get to the same goal. So there may be someone who says, Bible calls us to, to care for widows and orphans in their distress and to love the poor. That means the minimum wage should be fill in the blank amount. Someone else may say, I'm afraid that that's going to lead to more unemployment. Well, those are two people who have the same goal, and now they're going to sit down and they're going to argue about what's the best way to get there. And, and, and here's the data that will show uh, whether I'm right or you're right, and they can work their way through it. And then there are going to be some questions that we're going to leave to people's consciences. And if we don't, we're going to end up in, again, a situation of cynicism. And I say that as as someone who had a real crisis of faith as a 15 year old that was brought about uh, partly because I was looking at voter guides uh, that were being distributed with a Christian view uh, on a line item veto and on a, a balanced budget amendment. And to say, well, it certainly seems to me that these viewpoints that are, are laid out here are what these people would have held to even if Jesus were still dead. And uh, instead, they're using sort of the, the credibility of Jesus, the way that you might have a celebrity endorser uh, to come in and to market your product. Well, that leads to a sense of cynicism. So we know how to do this, I think, more than we think we do. We just need to apply it consistently. I have an example, a personal example of what Russell is saying. Um, I have a, a group of uh, women friends. We've known each other probably 50 years. And because of the pandemic, we've been doing Zoom calls. Uh, we used to get together in a different way. And, and uh, we, we uh, started talking a little bit about mask wearing and vaccination. 
and we weren't quite sure where we were gonna get in, uh, what kind of water we were gonna get in, I would make two observations. We had a, a broad range of opinion. And we had an ICU nurse um, who was seeing this firsthand. And we had an individual who said, I just think we should wait to get herd immunity. And you can imagine that the ICU nurse was uh, not all about the herd immunity. She was like, uh, get the vaccination because people are dying in the hospital that I see every day. But here's what happened. And I, I think it's because the one, we had deep relationships, high trust, and um, a, a real commitment genuinely uh, to the love of Jesus Christ. And the person who was the herd immunity person, she received the story of the ICU nurse without getting defensive, without being angry, and without leaving the call. Because clearly the ICU nurse was saying, you're wrong, that that's not gonna work. Um, and I think that the, the ICU nurse also didn't have a posture of how stupid are you, you know, for that. So delivery, and response to pushback are, are two sort of skills that help in this, this process of you know, speaking about the truth or the, like we said, the demands of justice. Almost every topic is going to receive pushback and every topic probably needs at some point some correction. This is great. I mean, you're essentially pastoring people in, in political discipleship and I, I'm hoping that uh, this can be a resource that more people uh, utilize because the conversations we're having now are the fragmented conversations I, I see happening all over even campus uh, and, and in the church. But I'm really grateful for all of your succinct, uh, very clear, very conviction uh, filled and, and, um, and kind of uh, Christian responses to, to what we're talking about. You know, we, we talked about race, but let's talk about gender as well. Right. What are your observations about the role of Christian women in the political process? Because we don't really talk much about the, the role of Christian women, especially. Um, what do we need to understand about gender and politics, especially in light of the last election, um, the rise of the Me Too and the Church Too movement? Uh, I wonder if uh, maybe Nikki and Shirley, you can ask first and then Russell and Justin, you can chime in after to, to share about um, an entire population that's slightly more than half of all of our constituents in the CCCU, if I think I'm right. Yeah, I mean, a couple things come to mind. Um, I think particularly in this last political season, right, two of the big stories were the evangelical voting bloc as well as suburban women. And so you, you have a lot of overlap uh, in that. Um, one of the things that I have found really interesting working uh, with that overlap um, is that um, I think that there is a way that uh, Christian women, uh, Christian leaders um, have a particular uh, moral authority that is still intact. There's been some uh, disintegrating of uh, moral credibility among sometimes male leaders or male Christian leaders. And I, I think um, that is when, when I'm working particularly with Christian women leaders, I am really trying to exhort women to be speaking out in the public space, because I still think that there is some um, retention of a Christian moral authority that happens for communities who are very receptive to women leadership. Um, the other thing that I have found that's been very powerful, and this really popped as we were doing some engagement around child separations, is the ability of Christian women to carry multiple stories that are beyond their own experience. And I think that that has been tremendously powerful because I think for all of our hopes that we are rational beings, we, <laughs> the way we make decisions is actually, uh, it, it sometimes is fairly illogical. Um, and, and I think God loves us in all of that. Um, I, not women, I'm saying people in general uh, make decisions um, from all sorts of things. But I have really been impressed um, at the ability for Christian women to hold stories across racial differences, across socioeconomic differences, um, maybe in the same way that Shirley was talking about this this group of women who you know that they're engaged on this thing and and that they can um, politically engage 
with the whole of these sometimes contradictory relationships and stories that are tucked in their hearts. So I just think that's a potent um, force. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think it's a potent force. And I think um, as a side note on the Me Too and Church Too, um, I, I think it, the, the Church Too movement really popped for us um, how we do need women's voices in the mix and, and some of the ways that, um, I mean, I dream that our Christian colleges and campuses, that our Christian fellowships would be places that would um, be trained in bystander uh, intervention. You know, that our Christian colleges and communities would be known for being places where sexual assault survivors would, would know to seek out because this is communities that understand what healing looks like and, and these sort of things. Um, and anyways, I, I think there's a lot of potency uh, looking at further engagement, particularly with Christian women and the political space. Well, that's an interesting question. I really liked, uh, Nikki, what you said. That was really beautiful. I hadn't actually thought about the conversation with my women friends as being any different than what I would find with a group of men and women that I've I've been with, um, but it's possible that, that that's true. So I'm instructed by that. And I really thank you for that observation. Um, I have always thought that um, there is no, there should be and um, no impediment or advantage by being a, a Christian woman leader or a Christian woman. I think it has to do with calling. Uh, and I think that if you are setting your eyes and ears on the calling that you may have, uh, then that should be for men and women to discern the call that they have. Now, the community in which you're in helps you both discern that call and have the courage to that call. So it takes um, mentorship and Christian community, perhaps if you're in a community where women's calls are diminished uh, for, for whatever reason. And I think too that, I, would, I hope that women don't have moral, moral authority. I hope that it's about men and women who have moral authority be, because of their relationship to Jesus Christ. I don't disagree with you, Nikki, what you're saying, but I think that is a, um, a defect, certainly. Um, and I have had uh, such amazing male colleagues always uh, in, the, in my vocational life that I have uh, esteemed and, and been co-journeyers with. Yet I do know um, that women can feel diminished in their context, to which I would say, again, know your calling, uh, find that group of mentors, et cetera, that will um, assist you in believing in that calling. And then you have to ignore the dismissors. You, you, you just have to have the courage of your convictions to um, lay them aside. And I, that is not easy, which goes to the other points. But um, the, I, I don't wanna see men and women's roles in, as, in terms of, um, I would like to see us all at our best. And Shirley, that's a good correction. I shouldn't have said moral authority. I should have said moral credibility. Oh, I think yeah. I think you're quite right. That's a that's a good clarification because it's really what is perceived as as different headlines are hitting mm -hmm. hitting the news and stuff like that. But I think um, I, I, um, an emerging and different kind of a credibility that is yeah. Yeah, I I just see um, when uh, sometimes there's this implied and and maybe rightfully so condemnation. Um, but I don't, I want, I, I want uh, uh, men and women to be their best uh, and shouldering for each other, right? So the dichotomy of men and women uh, sometimes I think can splinter the force of men and women being for each other in the calling that they have. And I, I certainly see the, the men and women in this square being for both men and women in ways that is powerful and, and would use that 
and, and commend it as an example. And since we, we were talking a few minutes ago about political and social and, and cultural kind of engagement, when one looks at not the people who are bloviating on Facebook, but the people who are actually actively involved at the, at the activist level in those uh, ways, uh, women's leadership uh, is actually more visible uh, than would be the case in some in some church uh, sectors. So, and, and that's really across the board. When I look at the uh, sort of cross-cutting kinds of uh, areas that I work in, uh, in the pro-life movement, who's at the forefront of the leadership of pregnancy resource centers? Usually uh, Christian women. Uh, when it comes to ministering to uh, migrant children and uh, separated families on the border, who's often at the helm of leadership? Christian women. Uh, when dealing with refugees, uh, who's often at the forefront of leadership, uh, Christian women. And then when we look at the debacle that has happened uh, in the church when it comes to uh, Me Too and, and Church Do, and we see the uh, horrific abuse of power uh, that has taken place as recently as the report that we saw just a couple of weeks ago coming out of Ravi Zacharias uh, Ministries. And we have to step back and say, how can this happen? And one of the, there are many reasons why this can happen, but one of the reasons actually is connected uh, to some of the things that we were talking about in terms of political ideology earlier that we should have seen long ago within the church, which is this mentality that personal ethics and, uh, and moral rightness can be defined and redefined by the cause, whatever the cause is. Uh, for, for a long time within the church, narcissistic abuse of power and predatory actions, usually by men, have been excused because of, uh, because of the cause. Uh, we don't want uh, the outside world to think poorly of Jesus. And so we tend to ignore these, uh, these flashing uh, warning signals uh, that should have been seen. And one of the things that's encouraging to me, and again, is the Bible would say it's, it's sort of a small cloud in the sky right now, but growing bigger. Are women who are uh, coming forward, telling uh, their stories and, uh, and talking about what it has been uh, to live through these patterns in ways that are helping to equip, as Shirley says, both men and women to say, how do we uh, move forward with the kind of credibility and conscience that Jesus would call us to? And I think there are some encouraging signs uh, right now on the, on the horizon. Yeah, I would just add shortly that, um, you know, I think in some in instances, the messenger matters. And there are some issues that I think women can speak into at this moment where, you know, men may, may struggle or just not get the message through as clear. For better or worse, I think we see instances where certain messengers speak into a situation a little bit differently. I know I've been... Um, I've been really excited to see the the uh, amount of representation, uh, especially when we're talking about in politics, when it comes to women just being in those seats, because if you look at something like the civil rights movement, I mean, let me say that there's that wouldn't have moved forward at all. You, you see a lot of men being kind of praised, but the Fannie Lou Hamers and all the folks who get no praise. A lot of time it was it was women. Uh, same thing in politics. I, it's hard for me to remember a campaign that I ran where women weren't you know, the, the driving force behind some of those things. And I think men, whether it be ego or whatever, sometimes have limitations in, in those uh, in those places where men, women may not have that. Now, I don't want to, you know, draw too much. I don't want to paint with too broad a brush, but that has been my experience in, in some instances. So I think we can take some of those things to, into account while at the same time realizing that race and gender, somebody's race and gender tell us nothing about their character their competence in general. And we, and we don't want to get to the point where we're, we're assuming somebody is competent or we're assuming that they're on our side or they're going to do the right thing or they have good character based on that. Um, but again, I think in some instances, the messenger does matter. And for instance, the Anne campaign has our um, whole life project, which was the kind of the sisters of the Anne campaign speaking into that. Um, and that made it, that, that really helped a lot of Christian women think through that who were leaning further and further left on that issue in ways that I might not have been, have been able to speak into. Uh, so it's some, something to keep in mind for sure. And I think what you're I'm driving uh, at, what you're talking about is that we can't deny that there are biases. And, and so where those biases become apparent, we need to speak out as men and women 
uh, to say that this is a bias and it is not God honoring. That's good. So we have about five minutes left and I wanna kind of uh, round it out to, to some practical steps. Um, there, there's really kind of two major forces. There's the, the political discipleship that's been taking place in the home. One of my students, Joshua Thomas, keeps mentioning how significant of a force that is and how polarizing it is when, especially with the, with the, the partisan idolatry that we're seeing uh, and the political idolatry that we're seeing within the evangelical world. Um, how it's how it's actually hurting many students' uh, lives, their relationship with their families uh, and their friendships. What would you do, or what would you say to someone who's dif who's finding it difficult uh, to kind of bring this up or navigate this reality within their homes? And then the other thing I would say is maybe you can kind of touch on both within un within like a minute each. Um, you know, our campuses often do ref, uh, reflect a broader society. The, the tensions that exist in the world, which tends to be a little more segregated than our campuses, uh, show up on uh, in our dorms, in our classrooms. Um, how would you encourage those of us in the CCCU institutions or in higher education more broadly to navigate this, whether we're students, student leaders, staff, faculty, or administration. And so maybe say something to the home and say something to kind of the, the Christian higher education world. Well, I would, I would just say, first of all, People don't change by being humiliated in arguments. Uh, and that's what we assume, is that we sit down and we have a debate, whether on social media or in a dorm room or at a Thanksgiving table, and that at the end of that 20-minute discussion, someone's going to say, you're exactly right, I was wrong, uh, what must I do to turn this around? That's, that, that almost never happens. Instead, people change what seems to be very slowly as they consider things from a little bit of a distance and as they imitate uh, Jesus says, come follow me. People are, are imitating him even without, uh, he, he tells them later what it is that they're doing. And so I would say when you have a divided sort of home or a dorm room or a campus, there, it is perfectly appropriate to say, look, you and I disagree. We love each other. And we're not able to have that conversation right now without tempers flaring. And so we're not have those conversations right now. There are some relationships you have where you're able to say, we can disagree productively, and, and we do that all the time, at other places where it turns in, into a compromise of the, of the relationship. And so what I say to people is, if your parents uh, say to you, I can't believe that you are fill in the blank uh, politically, then sometimes it's appropriate to say, you know what, you and I see things differently, but I love you, and I want to have a relationship with you. And uh, can we just not it's not saying it's saying I want to be able to have the kind of connection with you that we can maybe talk about these things later on without exiling one another right now and, and sometimes that's the best place to start I'll just say something that my my husband and I always say together do you want a solution or do you want me to just listen and that can help set the stage, you know, like if you're with a roommate, are you looking for me to tell you the right answer or you would, would you like me just to listen? Yeah, I think we have to just put grace over pride. I think we go into situations and we're kind of egged on into saying the most witty thing or saying the most cutting thing when at the end of the day, that actually is uh, counterproductive right, when it piques someone else's pride and when it makes them less um, likely to listen, it may get you packed on the back and, and retweets, but it's really not getting you towards the goal, your, your stated objective. And too often we see we would rather have the, the feeling of, of clap back and, and, and getting, you know, getting our little shot in rather than really focusing on and, and doing the harder work. I wrote about this in Christianity Today uh, not that long ago. Sometimes it's harder to say something that might be somewhat piercing, but to say it in a way that is charitable. And some of the people that we uh, kind of lift up for, for what they say and all that really aren't doing the hard work of being artful and expressing things in a way that get the point across, 
but don't necessarily have to make someone else feel small or, or, or put them, you know, kind of in a, in a place of superiority or kind of this cold vanity that we have in how we address other people. As Shirley said, do you want to get something done? Do you want someone to listen to you and be, be persuasive? Or do you just want to force them to do it? And I think that's what it comes down to. We don't want to take the time to do the hard work and have the discipline of persuading people. We just want to compel them to do something. And if they don't do it exactly how we want them to, then we can just say that we knew they weren't any good anyway. Uh, but we just have to be willing. And I think it's a matter of effort. Uh, it, it's, it's a matter of focus. But we have to be willing to do the hard work of persuasion and understanding people, understanding their motivations, and working on our language and the way we, and, and really our tone and posture and how we address people. Yeah, I think, uh, Ray, your question is cutting too close to home. Uh, so when, when I think about uh, uh, something for the home, I do think um, pushing with curiosity past talking points is really helpful, like just trying to maintain a posture and just, and, and understand how, how are you getting there? How are you getting there? That kind of a thing. Um, and, and with our familiar relationships, like I think those are just longer than political cycles um, generally. Uh, but, but I think try, trying to get to maybe some grain of truth or something that is in this position that might be totally abhorrent to, to you. Um, I think on the campus, one of the things I really wish Christian leaders would do is because I love um, getting to hear about how Christian leaders are unpacking really, really tricky situations. And so I, I, I long for um, Christian leaders to be, feel a little bit more free uh, to, um, to show like, you know, these, these are the real tension points for me as I'm trying to figure this thing out. This is what I'm really wrestling with. Um, I appreciate the theologian Carl Ellis, who says, you know, where are you finding that in scripture and let scripture do the heavy lifting, you know, for you. So, but just um, part of that is it, it gets away from um, leaders giving conclusive statements and more about like revealing what the process, because I think in the long run, that's what the thing that's really going to serve our Christian young adults. We don't know what frameworks they're going to need in the next five, 10 years. Um, but if we can give them ways that they can wayfind with Jesus as, our, as the North Star, I think um, that, that will be a tremendous help. That was so good. Thank you all for uh, taking the time to, to be with us, to encourage us, to nourish us. Uh, I wish the only thing I wish we could have done is to have this be in person. But sadly, we are all over the country uh, virtually in our pixelated screens. But uh, thank you for pastoring us and for encouraging us and, and really uh, modeling for us uh, what we desperately need more of. Mm -hmm.